So thank you for joining us wherever you may be. We are here today to talk about storm restoration contract must-haves. And before we get started, uh, I have to confess that, that I uh, love contracts and they're really important and I love talking about them. And I know that sounds ridiculous because when Marjorie wants to talk about CPA stuff, I just internally roll my eyes and think, oh my God, please let's not. But uh, CPA stuff's really important. Contracts are really important. Everything that happens on the project starts with the contract. If you don't have a good compliant contract, you open yourself up for just um, so many problems. Um, I have a client who lost a $2 million contract because there was some language in there that shouldn't have been there. And we don't want that to happen to anybody ever again. So we are gonna talk about storm restoration contract must-haves. And before we get started, those of you who don't know me, maybe you wanna know a little bit about me. I am a construction lawyer. I have been a construction lawyer going on 20 years now. I have been board certified since 2015 when board certification was available for attorneys for construction law. So uh, before that, I actually worked in construction. My dad was a contractor. Um, my husband and I had our own contracting business. So uh, I've been a small business owner. I have uh, been in the trenches on contracts and um, this is my passion. So this is who I am. My disclaimer, I'm not offering anyone legal advice. These are my opinions. Before you implement anything discussed in this presentation, consult your own attorney. If you are my client, please do what I have recommended in this presentation. Okay, we're getting, here's a whole bunch of stuff that we're gonna talk about. And fortunately, since we are recording this, I don't have to rush. I can use my Texas voice and not my California voice. So here's some of the things that we are gonna cover. Scopes, public insurance adjuster issues, the right to supplement, deductibles, statutory uh, residential warnings, um, dispute resolution, what your warranty does and does not cover, which is a super important topic that I have litigated several times lately, as a matter of fact. What voids your warranty? Something as simple as having your address on your contract makes a huge difference. And uh, the right to collect for valuable work performed and a whole lot more. So let's get started. So something as simple as having your address on your contract makes a difference. If you want to foreclose on a homestead, your address has to be on your contract. Uh, and it's just more professional. And I know a lot of contractors out there, you have multiple, uh, you have multiple addresses, you have multiple sites. Um, sometimes you might be working from your home office and you don't necessarily want your home address on your contract, but having your contract uh, I'm sorry, having your address on your contract is uh, very important. And uh, there are virtual executive suites where you can get mail delivered. It's very inexpensive. And so if you need to go that route, please do. Um, and according to the statute, I don't think a UPS, USPS mail drop complies. It needs to be, I think, a physical location where you office even if it's virtual. So uh, start by having your address somewhere on your contract. Payment terms need to be in the contract. So there's basically two options for storm restoration work. One is a lump sum. And here are some of the things that need to be in a lump sum. Lump sum, fixed price. Uh, it's often called a retail contract. It's all the same thing. It's a defined scope for a defined price. Now, don't put yourself in a box. Make sure that you have, uh, of course, your exclusions and your inclusions. So it's clear what you're doing. Make sure that um, you leave yourself room to be paid for upgrades or change orders, supplements, uh, and price increases. I don't know that price increasing is uh, such a big deal anymore now that material supplies seem to have stabilized. But if somebody doesn't pull the trigger for six months, chances are good some price has gone up and you need the ability to capture that so you don't leave an open-ended um, 
situation for yourself that ends up costing you money. Uh, the more common, of course, in the industry is the contingency contract. Uh, it needs to be for the full RCV value of the claim, not proceeds. Proceeds is not the full RCV value, and you can end up inadvertently costing yourself money by using the term proceeds. So it's the full RCV value of the claim plus the owner deductible, plus all supplements, plus recoverable and non-recoverable depreciation, owner upgrades, code compliance, general contractors overhead and profit. And of course, uh, you need to have something in there about the timing of how you get paid. Um, the value of a lump sum contract is everybody's really clear about what the contract is or is not for and what's being done, et cetera. So, um, but you obviously, you aren't gonna know that if you get the contract signed early in the process, because of course that whole process of going through insurance evaluation, et cetera. So signing a, a contingency contract makes more sense. Um, I think it protects the contract protects your right to do the work. But what you want to consider is how you can turn that contingency contract into a fixed price contract. And you can do that with a lump sum addendum. So here's some reasons why that's a good idea. It's an option for avoiding the uncertainty of a perhaps hazy scope and price. Uh, it's an addendum, which means it does not replace the original contract or give the owner the impression that they can back out of the contract. So it is, it's an add on, it's in addition to, it's not in replacement of. Um, and uh, it needs to be signed or somehow acknowledged by the property owner. Now, if you send, an addum, if you send a lump sum addendum or you send a text message or you send an email and you say, here's what we're gonna do, here's the final price. And the owner emails you back and says, get started, or simply just allows you to get started. That's the next best thing to a signature, but a signature on a formal addendum is the A answer to enforceability. So here's just an example, and I know this is really tiny, but here's an example of what an addendum might look like. And it has the job name, the job address, the date. It has the final approved scope of work. You can Put in here, see exhibit A, and that might be the final estimate from the insurance carrier. It might be your own final estimate. So you can have a, a, a you know, see attached exhibit A, or you can list right here what it is you're gonna do. Here's the final approved contract price, it's X. And then here's the acknowledgement that um, the owner understands that all the terms in the contract are incorporated by reference and that this is not you're waiving the right to ask for additional funds later on if that's appropriate and oftentimes that is. So here's just an example of an addendum. And by the way, anybody, if uh, you want a copy of this presentation, I'm happy to send that to you. My contact information is in here, um, but it's Karen at EB, like Edward Boy Law, Texas.com. And if you'll email me, we'll be happy to provide this to you. So um, if you don't have an addendum, or let's say um, it's the common situation where the insurance company just doesn't want to approve uh, a scope that is acceptable to you, and you refer the insured to an attorney or to a uh, an appraiser or to a public insurance adjuster or the like. Um, if you do appraisal, you're gonna get usually a, a defined scope back. But if you refer it to a PA or to an attorney, it's entirely possible all you're gonna get is a bucket of money. And in that case, there is never going to be a defined scope. And the owner's gonna say that they don't have a contract with you because there's no defined scope. So. Um, two or three years ago, when I updated my contract, we created this language right here to address that issue. So what it does is it says if all the owner gets is a bucket of money, then the maximum scope of repairs that was developed by the contractor 
or anyone else, so that could be the PA or whomever, is going to be the scope. And the price to be paid is going to be the industry standard pricing, which of course is Xactimate or pretty close to it. And so this way, um, if there is no defined scope, you have a way of creating a defined scope and saving the contract and hopefully saving some argument with the insured um, down the road. So that's an option to consider. Another alternative to contingency contracts is the kind of the AB contract of the service agreement and then the construction contract. And so the way this works is uh, you have a service agreement that basically says you are going to at no charge evaluate the claim, the damage, you're gonna generate an estimate and you're going to present that to the insurance adjuster you're gonna do all of that at no charge. Now, we're gonna talk about UPPA a little bit, although that's not the focus of this presentation, but um, it's really important that at every step of the process, when you are uh, either in writing in your contract or in your communications with your owner or the adjuster, you're providing technical expertise as the construction expert about what the damage is, how the damage occurred, what needs to be fixed to restore the property to its pre-damaged condition, and how much that should cost. You stay in your lane, you talk about that, stay away from policy issues, and you know, nine times out of 10, you're gonna avoid any claims of UPPA. So you're providing technical expertise to the owner and the adjuster. You're doing that at no charge. In exchange for that, the owner agrees that once the insurance company accepts the claim, and they approve a uh, scope of repairs that you can accept, then uh, the owner's gonna sign a contract. And it's going to be basically a lump sum contract at that point. Now, you'll notice I did not say agree. I said insurance is going to approve or insurance is gonna issue and you're gonna approve. So anytime you use the word agreement, that gives rise to a claim of UPPA because agreement sounds too much like negotiation. So try to exercise that word out of your vocabulary and uh, you'll, you'll be better for it. But this is another uh, alternative to contingency contracts. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that have to be in your contract. So this is a must have, gotta have it, I actually had somebody earlier this week who tried to cancel a contract because my client had the language in the contract, but they didn't have the right font. So you're required to have this in the contract. It is a violation of law not to have it in there, but it does not give anyone the right to void a contract because it's missing or it's um, defective in some way. But minimum 12 point bold font, this is the only warning that is a 12 point font. Everything else is a 10 point font. So this is extra important because it's a bigger font, minimum 12 point bold font located anywhere in the contract. I'm a big fan of the first page because obviously this is a continuing area of misunderstanding with insureds about whether or not they need to have to pay the deductible and effective 9119 it is no longer optional not to pay the deductible. So uh, the yes, no box and the reference to HB 2102 is optional, but the language here in the middle of the page is not optional. Now I created this little yes, no box with a deductible because I always have a concern that an owner is gonna try to pull a fast one, say there is no insurance um, involved in the claim, or involved in the build back or whatever you wanna call it. And they might lie about what their deductible is. It is a strangely written law in that uh, it is the contractor's obligation to collect the deductible. So if the owner tells you their deductible is 1500 when it's 3000 and you've only collected 15, then you have not met your statutory duty to collect the deductible. So if somebody's gonna tell a lie, about how much the deductible is, I want it to be the insured, 
So I want them to check yes or no and fill in the deductible amount. And that's the reason why that's there. It's not required. It's just, it's just, you know, one of those belts and suspenders thing that we as attorneys are so fond of. So this is the first requirement in the contract. The three-day right to cancel is the second requirement. Now it's only required for homeowners. It's not required for commercial. It's not required for rent houses. Uh, it's required for someone who lives in their home that is sold services door to door. This is door knocking or anywhere other than the contractor's place of business. So if you meet somebody at the ballpark and they say, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm a roofing contractor. And you guys start talking about what you do and whether they've had damage at their home and they invite you over to take a look at it. You have solicited the service at a place other than your place of business and this three-day right to cancel is required. So it's not just door to door, but it is for contractor initiated solicitations of contracts. So why does it matter? Because until someone who is required to be given the three-day right to cancel is given the three-day the three right, they can cancel the contract at any time. They can cancel the contract two years after the work is done. So it's crazy. to make sure that you're following this law. Um, I have a lot of contractors who ask me, you know, should I have it in all my contracts? Should I have it in some of my contracts? That depends on the level of sophistication of your sales force. So if they can differentiate between when it's needed and when it's not needed, then you can have a contract with a three-day ride in it and you can have a contract without a three-day ride in it. It just really depends. Uh, personally, I think it's better to have it and not need it. If somebody doesn't want you and they want to cancel the contract, you know, five or 10 days after they've signed it, probably best just to let them go. There are certainly, of course, circumstances where that's not the case. But um, for those who are required to be given the notice, it's very, very important that you give it. And this is a huge area of uncertainty and miscommunication. So let's talk about the parts that go into the three-day right to cancel. So it's three business days, not three calendar days. So that's, that's the first uh, thing that is important to remember. And the notice is effective when it's stuck in the mail, not when it's received. So you don't have to receive it within three business days. It has to be file stamped within three business days. The right to cancel cannot be waived. Now, if you have to do emergency work because there's water pouring in through the roof, that's not subject to the three-day right to cancel. Go ahead and do what you need to do, uh, tarp it, dry it in, whatever the case may be. The owner is going to have to pay you for that. But you know anything that's not an emergency that's performed within those uh, first three business days, uh, you do that at your own risk because you're entitled to be paid the reasonable value of the work, but um, it's just better not to have a fight about it, frankly. This, this is something that's too easy to comply with, not to comply with it. There's a three-step process. You have to do all three things to comply with the law. So the first is cancellation language has to be in the contract immediately adjacent to the signature block. And we're going to see that in a minute. That means uh, to the left, to the right, immediately above or immediately below. So it has to be the right language in the right font, et cetera, et cetera, it has to be immediately adjacent to the signature block. You have to tell the homeowner that they have the right to cancel before they sign the contract. And you have to provide paper copies of the cancellation form. So you can have the contract signed electronically, but they still have to have paper copies of the cancellation form because the Texas legislature apparently doesn't want anyone to have to have a computer or a smartphone in order to cancel a contract. So paper is the lowest, uh, simplest medium, and that's what complies. You must provide the consumer with a complete copy of the contract at the time it is signed. 
It must have the date it was entered into, the name and address of the merchant, and the statement in immediate proximity that says, drum roll please. You, the buyer, may cancel this transaction at any time prior to midnight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, resist the urge to rewrite that. If the statute, uh, if the Texas legislature has approved language, just don't rewrite it. Just put it in there just exactly as it appears. You, the buyer, may cancel, et cetera, et cetera. See the attached notice of cancellation form for an explanation of this right. This is small, but this is the notice of cancellation. So here we have the date of the transaction. That's the date the contract is signed. You will need to fill out name of merchant. That's you, address of merchant, uh, not later than midnight of, and you're going to choose three business days from the date of the transaction. So, and they're going to put here the date that they cancel and they're going to sign it and they're going to mail you a copy. So this must be in bold font, 10 point bold font. So believe it or not, if you don't have this bolded, then you don't comply with the statute. So just uh, comply with the statute. Okay, then we have some residential disclaimers beyond those two. Uh, leaving some of them out is no harm, no foul, but in others, you can be subject to a fine or even render the contract void. So we talked about the three-day right can render the contract void. It's not really a disclaimer, but certainly can render your contract void. So a couple of uh, disclaimers I wanted to talk about here first. This is uh, the Texas Property Code Chapter 27 warning. This is actually contractor friendly. The purpose of this warning is to force a homeowner to give the contractor the right to fix something that the homeowner thinks is wrong before the homeowner goes out and runs up a big bill and tries to stick it to the contractor. So this is the RCLA, Residential Construction Liability Act um, provision here. It's a 60 day process. It is again, not the subject of this presentation, but uh, nonetheless, anyone, if you have any questions about the RCLA and how it applies, uh, if you wanna shoot me an email, we're happy to talk to you about that. If a homeowner does work and does not give the contractor the opportunity to repair it or to offer a settlement of uh, any defects in the work, the owner is not allowed to recover anything they paid. So actually we had a client not very long ago who had done some work actually on a rental property, which is still a residential property. So it wasn't, it wasn't somebody's homestead, it was a rental property. They had done some work, the owner, uh, the husband liked the work, the wife didn't like the work and uh, had it all torn out and redone. And um, they, they, the um, owners of the property ended up having to pay our client for the work that was performed and they were not able to recover anything for any alleged defects because they did not go, they did not follow the 60 day process. So it's a very important right that contractors have that they're not aware of. So you wanna be aware of that. And you are required to have this notice in your contract. Anywhere in the contract is fine, minimum 10 point bold font. Now the failure to have this in your contract uh, can result in a $500 penalty. I've never seen the penalty assessed, but failure to have these kinds of things in your contract just opens you up to unnecessary vulnerability. There's just no reason. There's no reason not to comply. So uh, this is one of those requirements. Another of these requirements, and again, this is friendly to the contractor, right? You and your contractor are responsible for meeting the terms and conditions of this contract. This is Chapter 41 of the Texas Property Code. If you sign this contract and fail to meet the terms, you may lose your rights to your home. That's pretty serious. So uh, this is a good, uh, it's a good thing to have in your contract. It's a requirement of the contract. Uh, it's a violation of the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act, which is a consumer act uh, that was created for the benefit of consumers and for their protection. 
And if it's committed knowingly, you can be charged up to three times the damages. Now, uh, what exactly the damages would be, I don't know, unless somebody actually had their home foreclosed on without having this warning in there, they could say they had no idea, perhaps. Um, but failure to have this, um, the, I mean, the good news is, I guess, maybe failure to have this warning in the contract does not invalidate a lien filing. So, so anyway, this is a, yet another must have in your contract. Okay, let's talk about the optional stuff. So this is the stuff that, um, that I like to talk about. Okay, so if I had a dollar for every contract I saw that says this contract is void if insurance does not approve uh, the claim, we could all go have a very nice dinner somewhere on an airplane, maybe not, but nonetheless, this is a, a mistake that I see a lot in contracts. So, um, the problem with that provision, you know, this contract is void if not approved by the insurance company is the insurance company uh, very often will initially decline coverage only to come back and pick coverage up. If that's the case, you have given an owner the ability to get out of the contract uh, when you did not really intend that. So what I like is I like it to be voidable at the, at the, uh, um, on the part of the contractor. So here is a couple of options for language. This proposal may be withdrawn, not accepted within X number of days. That's not anything to do with the void or voidable. That is simply because you don't wanna leave a contract hanging out there for weeks or months at a time. You want to both create urgency and you wanna not leave yourself open for you know, price increases, et cetera. So that first part really is just about that. Uh, or in the event owner's insurance declines sufficient coverage for owner's damages made the subject of this contract. So um, this is um, not as direct, um, but it gets the job done. So if, if you are concerned about a, a homeowner who might um, balk a little bit at the whole, it's not void, you know, that they, that they think they're going to have some obligation, whether the insurance company approves or not. Uh, this is one option. Uh, this is a little more direct. In the event insurance denies owner's claim, this agreement is voidable at the option of contractor. And I think I, I'm a fan of plain speaking. I like alt number two. I like this alternative. Um, and I simply tell my clients if they have concerns coming from homeowners that nobody wants to do a job that doesn't have enough money to pay for it. So if, if the insurance company is not going to approve a sufficient scope, there's no basis for the contractor to want to go forward with the, the contract and you know they're not going to pursue it. This, of course, is just some additional language here at the bottom. After the right to cancel is passed, any attempt to terminate this agreement is a material breach, and that's a fancy legal term that means something. It's a, it's a material breach of this agreement and entitles contractor to damages. So that's just warning, warning, warning. Uh, don't try to cancel this contract after your right, if any, to cancel it has passed. So void avoidable, that's a big deal. Uh, here's another big deal, and here's another um, thing that's misunderstood. So um, a termination fee is enforceable as long as it does not exceed your anticipated net loss profits. So uh, you're entitled to lost profits if the insured cancels the contract without any legal basis for doing so. You don't need anything in the contract to give you the right to get paid your lost profit. Um, that's a right that you have by law. It's uh, just, I don't know, hundreds and thousands of cases that have run through the system in Texas that hold for the proposition that the non-breaching party is entitled to be made whole um, for a breach by the other party on a contract. You're made whole when you are paid your lost profit. So um, the termination fee is there um, to help encourage the insured to honor their contractual obligations. 
So uh, it's a substitute for lost profit. It cannot exceed uh, the anticipated net lost profits. Net means after you've paid your materials, your labor, your equipment, you know, all, everything, including your commissions. So net profit is after commissions. If you're not paying commissions, then obviously you don't need to worry about that. Um, you wanna call it a termination fee, not liquidated damages because liquidated damages are something else entirely. And there's a whole separate analysis that is required for liquidated damages that you can simply avoid by calling it a termination fee, not completely, but largely. So I'll call it a termination fee. And along with the termination fee, you are entitled to recover any third party fees such as engineering fees, or if you, you know, have, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, one of those services that comes out and uh, takes a look at the roof and, and gets the roof layout. Sorry, it's been a long week. Um, you know, any fees that you pay out of pocket, you're entitled to be recovered for those. And, you know, your entire, <clears throat> if it's in the contract, you can get your consultant fees for the time that you spend developing the value of the owner's damage claim. So I actually looked at a contract yesterday, uh, a client has in there, uh, you know, after X number of hours of claim development, and it's not claim development, but um, he charges, I think it was $165 an hour. And because it's in the contract and because the insured signed the contract, uh, he's entitled to be paid for that. So um, it's reasonable. It's not a PA fee, right? We're not acting as public adjusters. We are not negotiating the claim. We're not evaluating the policy terms. We're developing the owner's damage claim. And you're entitled to be paid your time for that if you have asked for it in the contract. So termination fee. Uh, UPPA disclaimer. So um, everybody in Texas who's a storm restoration contractor needs to have this in their contract uh, or something very similar to it. Owner acknowledges contractor is not a public insurance adjuster, is not offering or providing public adjusting services. So why does this matter? Because you can inadvertently say something or maybe have some oblique reference somewhere in your contract that looks like it might be a promise to act as a public adjuster. By having this specific disclaimer, you are pretty far down the road uh, in uh, defending yourself against that UPPA claim. Now, this is, not gonna do, this is not going to be a defense if you're actually negotiating the claim. So, but if, if you're not negotiating a claim and it's kind of, you know, tie goes to the runner kind of a deal, this is going to help clarify so the owner cannot come back and say, oh, well, I really thought that, you know, they were acting as my public adjuster. I like this to be in bold. I like this to be a 10-point font, um, front page Ideally, if there's room, if not on the terms and conditions up at the top. So UPPA disclaimer. Material shortages, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I don't know that this is the big deal that it was a year ago. A year ago, it was terrible. There, I think, are still um, some delays in getting materials. There's still some shortage. If you have a concern about that, then certainly you want to have something in your contract that says, that if, and, and this minimum notice is probably just a good idea in general principles, but you need something in the contract that says, look, if I can't start, because I can't start, that's not a default and you don't get to cancel my, my contract. Subject to management approval. Um, I see this in contracts a lot and I'll tell you I'm not a fan. Um, and here's why I'm not a fan because it's not really a contract until the approval is obtained. So um, you, you can end up not having the contract that you thought you had because you're making it subject to management approval. Now, why do contractors do it? Um, well, sometimes they just do it because they saw it in someone else's contract and they thought it was cool. Other times 
contractors, especially with a large sales force, have concern about whether or not something has been sold that they want to actually build. And if that's the case, that is a legitimate concern uh, because it does provide better control over jobs that are sold by outside sales. No question about it, because you have the right to reject a contract uh, because it doesn't get management approval. If you want to do that, then what you need to make sure is you have a, a consistent process in place to evaluate contracts quickly and approve or disapprove them quickly. Um, because until it's approved, it's not a contract. So um, I like to see a place for management to sign or an initial that goes back to the insured and uh, so that they know it's been approved and language in the contract that says ordering materials or commencement of work constitutes approval. Because literally you could mistakenly never initial that little management approval sign and not have a contract even after the work is done, which would be ridiculous, but I've seen crazy things happen. So the way to avoid that, if you want to have that level of control is to make sure that you've got processes in place to have formal approval that's communicated to the insured. Okay, performance standards. Um, I've seen contracts that have absolutely no performance standards in them at all. And, um, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's, it's better to have it in there. It certainly is something that you wanna be able to tell a prospective client, you know, here's the standard that we meet with every project. Um, if you're doing residential, there are minimum standards that are required by statute, um, you know, has to be habitable, et cetera. So uh, what defines the standard or what do you want to control your work? Industry standards. So industry standards is a C plus or a B minus. That's really what industry standards are. It's what an average contractor would do. And that's not a terrible thing, but just understand the construction industry standards, that's what it means. Manufacturer's recommendations. Um, if you're not gonna follow manufacturer's recommendations, of course you're doing that at your own risk, don't have it in the contract. And uh, by the way, if there's ever a situation where you cannot follow the manufacturer's recommendations, Either the owner doesn't want to pay the delta between what insurance approves and what's needed for that, or whatever the reason may be, make sure that you get something in writing from the property owner where they are acknowledging that you are doing something outside manufacturer recommendations and it may or may not affect the warranty. Because I've seen, I've seen problems arise due to issues with not following all the manufacturer's recommendations and then the owner down the road has a problem and they start pointing fingers. So all applicable codes, um, you know, generally speaking, the uh, city in order to pull a permit says that you are agreeing that you are going to follow all manufacturer's recommendations and all code requirements. Um, so again, just something to consider. We talked about good and workmanlike. Um, my dad actually uh, was a contractor, I told you that, but after he uh, closed his contracting business, he was a, a construction expert, and I reviewed his contract one time, and he had something in there about the highest standards of whatever, and I'm like, dad, <laughs> don't do that, because um, it gives the insured in, the, in our case, not in his case, but it, give, it gives the contracting party uh, something to pick at. Because if you miss one little thing about that high standard, then you haven't met your contractual obligations. So certainly do your work to the highest standard. Um, make sure you're doing quality work. Um, that's important, no matter what your contract says. But be careful about what you're promising in your contracts, because you can be held to it. And it can be uh, it can be really painful and expensive if for some reason that there, there's an oops that you had no control over. Okay, scope exclusions. Um, so, I mean, some of these are just, you know, super obvious, but they don't always make it into 
uh, the contract. So, um, you know, utility lines up underneath the deck. Uh, my contracts have gotten more and more specific on this issue as the years have gone by. And now really what they say is that the contractor's not liable for um, any work that is not in conformance with current code. So not the code when the property was built, but current code, because you know, over the last 40, 50, 60, 70 years, I mean, some of these houses have been around a long time and, you know, the way things were done back in the day is not the way they're done now. And, you know, I had an owner not too long ago say, well, my home is in compliance with the code in 1984 when it was built. Therefore, you're liable because you hit my gas line. So understand this is, this is a huge issue. Um, and I'll tell you, we had a lawsuit that went to trial, jury trial. And um, this was a huge issue in the lawsuit. And uh, we were able to prevail on behalf of our client and you know, we're gonna get our client paid, but it's a big deal. So make sure that you're really clear in your contract about this issue. Uh, nail pops, um, you know, cracks in the drywall, flaking, et cetera. Broken bases, which is just my way of saying, you know, anything that's on the wall that could fall down and break should be taken down. Damage to landscaping, driveways and walkways. And this is one of those things where you don't really necessarily think about it until you have a problem, but there's no way to tell from looking at a driveway how thick it is, whether it has rebar, et cetera. There's no way to tell, you know, you know, what's underneath the driveway and whether there was proper compaction, et cetera. And you put a heavy delivery vehicle on there and you can crack the driveway really easily. I know a lot of you have, you know, experienced that. And if you're doing normal construction activities and you're not being um, reckless, then that's not a damage that you should be responsible for. And so that's why that's in there. Uh, damage is caused by acts of God Failure to maintain. Failure to maintain is a big deal. Settlement, of course, this is Texas. And then we have injuries to people, pets, and possessions inside the work zone. We had a client actually not very long ago call us and say that um, somebody dropped a bundle of shingles on top of a visitor to the home as they were exiting the home, which is really terrible. Fortunately, that person was not injured. But, you know, keeping people away from the work area is really, really important. And our contract has a provision in there that says that the owner is uh, indemnifying the, the contractor for any damages that arise because of people, pets, or possessions inside the work zone. And then cosmetic issues, of course, you know, scuffing, et cetera. Um, you wanna address that in the contract if that's something that's meaningful to you. And then this, of course, the, the longer I do this, um, the smaller the font gets on my contracts because the more things we run into. And here's something that we ran into not very long ago um, where we had, uh, it was an HOA, it was a, it was a condo. So we, we had a condo owner complain that our client basically broke his roof. Um, and client had to hire an engineer to come out and say, no, uh, the reason why you have that giant sag right there is because your rafters uh, have been broken in the past, or I don't remember now if it was the rafter that was broken, or if it was just a sag because it was not built um, true and, and square. And really, I don't think any roof is perfect. But uh, having these, uh, having these uh, disclaimers here, uh, especially the one about sagging and out of level plumb rafters and that installation of the new roof may intensify the appearance. And I don't know if it intensifies the appearance, but I think people are more apt to look at their roof when it's new and they're going to see things that they just never noticed before. And so this is, this is one of those kind of cut them off at the knees kind of provisions that is helpful to have in the contract. Opportunity to cure is a big deal. And of course, you know, with the RCLA, they have to give you an opportunity to cure. 
But these opportunities to cure here uh, happen before the RCLA gets triggered theoretically. So, um, you know, I've seen, I've seen all kinds of provisions that relate to opportunities to cure. Some of them are gonna say, you know, you have to tell us in 48 hours, that, that's unrealistic, but okay. Um, you know, some say you have to tell us within, you know, whatever, whatever, the, whatever that may be. Um, owner cannot withhold payment based on minor repairs. That's very important because I've seen owners, you know, withhold $25,000 because, you know, there was $1,500 worth of disputed work. And, um, you know, you need something that says, no, you can't do that because otherwise they think they can. So. Uh, owner must notify in writing any alleged defects. Um, you know, how long should they have to give notice? You know, kind of depends on what the damage is, right? If they have an active leak, they want to, you want to be given notice as quickly as possible so that you can mitigate the damages, um, you know, et cetera. So opportunity to cure is a, is a big deal. Change orders. Um, not as much for our storm restoration clients, but our commercial subcontracting clients, uh, we fight about change orders a lot. Um, change orders and retainage, those are the two big things. Uh, so for those of you who want to be commercial roofing contractors, change orders and retainage is what you fight about. And it's all about the paperwork. Uh, it's, a, it's a crazy world. Uh, however, for for those of us here that are listening uh, and we're storm restoration contractors, change orders are still really important because um, things change in construction. You're gonna run across something that you didn't expect or the owner's gonna want something that they didn't even know they wanted. And um, that's gonna generate a change order. If your contract says that you have to have a written change order, you are shooting yourself in the foot because the owner can simply say, well, I don't have a written change order, so I don't have to pay you for that extra work. So let's not do that. Let's say that we have the right to perform work on a verbal and we have the right to charge the reasonable cost of the work. So that if a homeowner says, I would like you to, I don't know, paint all the fascia or, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, um, and you don't, have a fixed price before the work starts, you're entitled to the reasonable cost of the work. Um, so this is a big deal. It's a simple thing to address. Um, so rather than have your contract say, you know, changes, you know, all changes will be done, you know, in writing. This, this, is, this is better, this is better for you. Now I will say, if you have written contracts with your subcontractors, you want them not to have the right to do verbals and you really want, to have a different arrangement, which is the no changes are performed without a written change order so that you can control your job costs. So what you want with your owner and what you want with your subcontractor is two different things. The right to supplement. Um, supplementation is obviously a big, big thing in storm restoration work. And uh, you need to be able to supplement. I don't no, I, there, I, we have some clients who don't supplement very often, but that's, um, that's not the norm. So you want the right to supplement and you need to get that right from your owner. Um, you also need to just frankly educate your owner about the process of storm restoration work and the dynamic between the insurance company, the insured and the contractor because um, some adjusters will try to triangulate and uh, drive a wedge between the contractor and the owner. And you want to uh, be educating the owner and let them know that you and the owner are um, on the same side. You're trying to get the owner's home fixed properly. And um, to do that, you almost always need a supplement. So the right to supplement is a big deal. And then along with that right to supplement is um, the authorization to contact the adjuster. So not just about supplementing, 
but about payment. Um, if you have this in your contract, um, you are worlds ahead of those who don't have this in your contract because we don't want the adjuster saying, you know, I don't have to talk to you. Um, they are supposed to talk to you because they've been directed by the insured to talk to you. So authorization to contact the adjusters um, and an important term in a contract. Overhead and profit um, is for sure the most contentious issue um, out there for storm restoration contractors. And you know, for those of you maybe who have never done any other kind of contracting, nobody else breaks their overhead and profit. Well, it's very uncommon uh, for a commercial contractor to break out their overhead and profit. It's almost always built into the individual line items. And the reason why it's done that way is because it's harder to pick at if it's um, built into the other line items. So Xactimate doesn't do it that way. Um, nonetheless, it's it's a super contentious issue. Insurance companies say, you know, we don't have to pay it because the job's not complex enough, or we'll pay for everything but the roofing because you're a roofing contractor, or you know, the three trade rule or whatever that may be. There is no such thing as a complexity rule or a three trade rule. That's just a made up thing. We all know it. Um, nonetheless, the right to enforce payment of overhead and profit belongs to the insured. And since the insured isn't getting the money, it's really difficult to get them to help with that. You have to really uh, give them a carrot or a stick that makes them want to help get you paid overhead and profit. So um, including a contract term, this is something along the lines of owner recognizes that you know company is acting as their general contractor and you are because unless you're self-performing, you are a general contractor. Owner understands that contractor will be charging overhead and profit and agrees to pay for it. So obviously at the point where they've agreed to pay for it, it's an incurred cost. And we all know what that means. But if you have one place in your contract that says that um, the insured is not required to pay for anything that insurance doesn't pay, then this provision right here agrees to pay is meaningless. So, um, and honestly, if you push the agrees to pay too hard, then you know you may lose the sale. So it's really a difficult situation. Um, nonetheless, incurred costs um, are something that can be passed on to the insurance company, although it may take a public adjuster or appraisal or an attorney to go ahead and get that for you. Um, and just as an aside, um, appraisal is, a, is good for that sort of thing. Um, PAs are really good at that sort of thing because they can really talk about the policy provisions and the law. And of course, you know, lawyers can sue people. So that's always, it's always an option. So overhead and profit. Um, don't tell the adjuster they owe it, please, because that's crossing that line and, and just, just don't do it. So um, get the owner on your side. Um, get the owner to help you get paid for overhead and profit whenever you can. And, you know, if you get it 75% of the time, you're doing something pretty great. Okay, payment terms. Um, I see a lot of contracts with absolutely no payment terms in them. Oops, let me go back, sorry. And um, that's a problem. So, um, and I, I have, we, have we have clients still who don't get paid at all until the work is complete. And they say it works fine for them, that they've never had a problem and they get paid and um, that's great. It makes me really nervous because nobody ever calls and says, hey, Karen, just wanted to let you know things are going great in my world and everybody's paying great and I'm making lots of money and life is good. I get called because something goes wrong. And one of, one of the most common things that goes wrong is I did this work and they won't pay me for it. So uh, um, payment terms, deductible paid as soon as possible after the contract is signed and the claim is accepted by insurance. And this is one of those kind of, if you're too insistent, uh, you can shoot yourself in the foot. But ideally, if they've chosen you and you're going forward and you're going forward in a fairly quick fashion, 
there's no reason why they can't pay you the deductible when they sign the contract or when you come back and pick out colors or whatever the case may be. So as we all know, the deductible can be financed. It can be charged on a credit card or paid by check. Um, it should be paid separately um, and it should say deductible. So it's perfectly fine for the ACB check um, to be used initially. They'll have to make up for it at the back end, right? But you know, you can have a materials draw and you can have the deductible paid. Um, and then you know the owner just has to catch it up somewhere down the road. But uh, for insurance companies who want to see that the deductible has been paid, which is hopefully going to be more and more insurance companies, uh, there's legislation, legislation that's currently before uh, the Texas legislature to have uh, to require insurance companies to get proof of payment of the deductible. So that I think, you know, over time, that's going to be more and more of a big deal. So if you need to show that it was paid, then and you're going to have to really get a separate payment for it. That's the simplest thing. Um, material draw, no later than the day before materials are dropped. And I say the day before, because I've gotten so many of those calls where the uh, contractor says, hey, you know, I showed up at the job. It's a one day job. You know, some of these smaller, it's a one-day job. The homeowner is mysteriously not there. The day materials are dropped and the job is finished before the contractor got any money at all if they didn't get the deductible paid up front. So the day before materials are dropped is a better option. So you have more of a chance of um, collecting the full amount that's owed or at least as much of it as you possibly can. And then, you know, if it's a complicated, lengthy job, if it's a commercial project, if it's, you know, going to last, you know, any amount of time at all, you may want to get paid by trade. You may want to get paid monthly. Um, you always want to get your final payment at substantial, not final completion, because I have seen owners refuse to accept the work is final. And if that's the case, then the last payment would never be due. So substantial completion means that the property can be used for its intended purpose. And it's really final completion minus punch. It's really what substantial completion is. And so I like to say that that final payment is owed at substantial completion. And then of course, interest for late payments. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So warranties, um, how long is the labor warranty for? What does it cover? Is it transferable? If so, how many times? Um, all those terms need to be in the contract, not just the warranty itself. And it uh, needs to be substantial and not final completion. Um, so those are all very true. And no warranty until, until paid in full. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, as close to a must have as you can get, that you are not gonna warranty a project that hasn't been paid for. But it needs to be specifically in the contract. I had a contractor not very long ago tell me that he didn't have to give the warranty because that's how it is in the industry. And I agree that's how it is in the industry. I recognize that's how it is in the industry, but the law um, is going to look first to the terms of the contract and enforce the terms of the contract. And if it simply says in the contract, no warranty until payment, then that's the end of it. And you don't have to ever talk about custom in the industry or who does it and who doesn't do it and when, et cetera. And then what voids your warranty? This is really important. Um, existing conditions, misuse or owner neglect, failure to maintain, settling, a new storm, anyone else working on your work, et cetera. So all of those things need to be considered and included in the contract and in the warranty. Advertising, generally speaking, uh, if, if you don't own it, you don't have the right to take a picture of it. And you certainly don't have the right to take a picture of it and put it out in the public. So if you want to use photographs of your work, 
or videos or whatever the case may be. Uh, if you want to interview um, owners, you need to get their permission. And ideally you would get their permission in writing. And so here's a very simple little sentence that you can put in the contract that will cover that. You might want to say photograph its work, you know, and the owner's likeness or whatever. But um, but you cannot, and you can get sued for invasion of privacy if you are using photographs you don't have permission to use. Some other terms, uh, restocking fees, who gets to keep any unused materials. Most of the time, the contracts I see all say that the contractor keeps the unused materials. Um, in the few times that I've had to deal with this issue, the contract did not say that. The owner thought they got to keep all the unused materials and it ended up being a problem. So just really simple, owner gets to keep all the unused materials. How do you handle delays due to weather, labor disputes, material shortages, et cetera? So these are the kind of things you need to consider when you're reviewing your contract to make sure that it's got everything in it that you need to protect yourself and to help you get paid. HOA approval, it should be the uh, homeowner's or the property owner's job to get HOA approval, not yours. Um, we've had some pretty contentious fights about this issue. And it can be avoided if the homeowner is the one that has to get the HOA approval. We talked a little bit about injury to the uninvited. And then here, owner agrees to aid in collecting your payment from the insurance company and is ultimately responsible for payment of your work. This is a really helpful provision to have in your contract because um, when you put the responsibility on the owner to make sure you get paid, you're likely to get paid more quickly and in full. So um, when they're responsible for payment in the event that insurance doesn't pay, they're more likely to wanna to get you paid. Then of course, the right to hire subs. I actually had a really silly lawsuit. It wasn't silly. I mean, it's a big deal, but it, the owner, one of the complaints was that our client did not self-perform the work. And um, there was actually a term in the contract that said they were using subs, but nonetheless, uh, the owner really thought, I guess that the salesperson was gonna go out and install the roof and we're really, upset when that ended up not being the case. So the right to hire subs is, a, is important. Just, you know, throw it in there. You know, it's a, it's a single line in the contract, but it can help you avoid arguments. Arbitration or litigation. So I used to be um, not a fan of my life just went out. I used to not be a fan of arbitration, but the longer I do this, the more I like it. I, I think the service has become better and that's part of it, but it's so much quicker and it ends up being less expensive, even though you're paying for your judge, so to speak, because a lot of the foolishness um, that goes into litigation can be avoided Arbitration generally has little to no discovery and discovery is what's so very expensive about a lawsuit. So uh, arbitration uh, is a good vehicle and certainly if you're in a dispute with the homeowner, you do not wanna be in court. Um, it, is, it is not a fair fight, uh, especially in front of a jury. And so by choosing arbitration, you give yourself a, a professional who understands your business because arbitrators are almost always going to be attorneys who are construction lawyers, who understand construction basics. And, and that can be very, very helpful. So I like arbitration. At the very least, make sure that you waive the right to trial by jury. Um, juries, I like jury trials. And there are times when um, I want a jury. But, um, Juries will choose who they like and they'll find a reason to award them money oftentimes. And we don't want this to be a popularity contest. We want it to be the facts. And um, 
who's entitled to what by law. And so uh, we want to have uh, a jury trial waived, especially uh, in these kinds of disputes with homeowners. So if you want to arbitrate with a consumer, which is basically a homeowner, the arbitration provision must be a minimum 10 point bold font. If it's not, it's not enforceable unless you're in Denton County. Um, not really, but anyway, that's just a funny story. Um, include in the contract the right to recover payment to enforce the award. Because one of the little peculiarities about Texas law is um, you have to specifically spell that out in the contract or you do not have the right to enforce the award. And you can end up spending all the money uh, that you were awarded getting the award actually out of the hands of the loser. So make sure that you have that provision in your contract. And then, you know, here are some other things to be thinking about. Do you want to have mediation prior to arbitration? And I'll tell you that um, there are times when that is helpful, but most of the time, if you mediate too early, it's, it's just a box check thing and you just end up um, not settling anything. So I don't really know how helpful it is to mediate prior to arbitration. Um, only one arbitrator, the American Arbitration Association has all kinds of rules. And I like the American Arbitration Association, but uh, one of the rules they have is uh, disputes over a certain dollar amount, have three arbitrators instead of one, it's a panel. And um, that's great because you know three heads are better than one, but you're paying for three arbitrators. So um, if you have one arbitrator, then you're paying one fee and, and that's normally much more affordable. Uh, do you want to be able to conduct discovery? I like limited discovery um, because I think it's better to have an exchange of documents and be able to see what the evidence is gonna be prior to the final hearing. So I like to have some discovery. Um, we talked about waiving jury trials. You wanna waive class action lawsuits. And um, that's just really important for a whole lot of reasons that we don't need to talk about right now. Um, the owner waives consequential or exemplary damages. So basically, um, for those of you who are not familiar with what consequential or exemplary damages are, uh, direct damages are, there's a leak in the roof, the drywall gets wet, you have to repaint, re-drywall, and you have to replace flooring. That's a direct damage. Uh, and it's, um, consequential damage is uh, you had a roof leak, and there was somebody sitting under where the roof leak occurred, and they were working on their computer in the middle of getting ready to close a $2 million deal. The computer went on the fritz, and they lost the $2 million, and now they're suing you for $2 million. That's a consequential damage. And you want to waive that because there's no way to, um, there's no way to plan for that. Uh, exemplary damages are punishment damages. So you might hear them called punitive damages. They're for the purpose of making an example out of bad behavior. So you don't want exemplary damages. You don't want consequential damages. You want to be responsible for the damage you cause legitimately, that is a direct damage uh, from your work. Um, my contracts all limit the liability to the amount paid to the contractor. Um, that should be obvious, but um, it's just a way to uh, minimize your exposure on a contract. And then the right to file a lien for non-payment, you have that right by statute, but you know, just like the termination fee, if it's in the contract and the owner reads it, then they're gonna realize that you have the right to file a lien and they're gonna be more inclined to pay you. So it's really all about encouraging payment. And so that's, that's um, a provision that's helpful to have in the contract. Attorney fees. So in Texas, if you are enforcing a contract, that someone else has breached and you win, you are entitled to your attorney's fees, um, but by law. But you're not entitled to your attorney's fees if it's not a breach of contract situation. So 
uh, there's a lot of other kinds of claims that you can assert in a contract. Some of them are statutory and the statute provides for attorney's fees, other are silent. So um, it's so expensive to litigate and I wish that it wasn't, but it just is because it's complicated and there's just a lot of liability and there's a lot of work that ends up going into a lawsuit. So don't leave attorney's fees to chance. Uh, put in your contract that you're entitled to recover attorney's fees in any affirmative claim. That's a claim that you assert or successfully defending against an owner's claims. So successful defense of an owner claim does not entitle you to attorney's fees. So unless it's in the contract. So for instance, the owners paid you in full, you know, you've done your job, the owner paid you, and then the owner comes back later and says, oh, you know, I don't like the way you did whatever the case may be. And they sue you and you are in a completely defensive position because you've been paid in full. There's no attorney's fees available for that unless your contract provides for it. So it's really important to have that in there because that will help cut down on um, both claims that are asserted against you. And in the event one is asserted, you're able to show that your work was done correctly, you can recover your legal fees for proving that you were right. And of course, not just for filing suit, your attorney's fees should be available from the very first demand for non-payment. Interest um, is an little, interesting little topic. The default rate for breach of contract is 6%. You can charge up to 18% and that's per year simple interest. So it's not like the credit card companies do where it's 18% uh, in January and then they take that 18% and they add it to the principal sum. So in February, you're being charged you know, interest on $110,000 instead of $100,000. So it's simple interest, 1.5% per, per month is the maximum that's authorized by law. You cannot charge 2% or 5% per month for late fees, especially in addition to your maximum 18%. Um, if you do, you open yourself up to user recharges. Uh, those can be very expensive and uh, very expensive to defend. So 18% is a lot of money. And um, the purpose of that 18% is to encourage people to pay their bills. So that's the maximum that you can ask for. Um, if your contract has anything in, in excess of 18%, then you need to get that corrected. But you are entitled to interest. If you don't have anything in your contract to the contrary, you're gonna get 6%. Post judgment interest for a long time, uh, was 5%, that may have changed now that interest uh, has gone up on borrowing money, that may have increased a little bit, but um, that's that's been the default for a long time. Liens for non-payment. So it depends very much whether you are on commercial or residential property. So residential is a home that somebody owns that they are living in or that they intend to live in. So if somebody's having a custom home built, even though they're not living in it, that's still their homestead. Um, it's, uh, it can be really challenging to file a lien on a homestead that's actually the subject of a whole nother presentation, which I'd be happy to share with anybody who is interested in it. Um, constitutional liens are great if you're working directly with an owner on commercial non-homestead property. Um, otherwise, you've got property code liens. There are very short time frames for asserting a property code, and property code is the Texas Property Code, Chapter 53. Uh, there's a section for commercial and there's a section for residential. Uh, very short time frames. There's lots of rules associated with that and uh, too lengthy for me to go in here, but if you have any interest in learning more about that, I'm happy to share it. So property code liens, constitutional liens, contractual liens. A contractual lien may not trump a constitutional uh, protection of a homestead right. But here's the thing, um, if you have it in the contract, it, it um, can very well help encourage someone to pay their bill. So, um, 
contractual liens are, are they just exactly what they sound like. They're a lien that arises by virtue of a contract. So you are granting the right to a lien by virtue of signing the contract. I, I, I've never seen any special language, but I can't promise you there isn't some there. If you wanna start using contractual liens, that's gonna be something you wanna spend some time uh, thinking about and talking to your uh, legal team about. Um, must be included in the contract to be enforceable. Um, so that's that. Here's the language that we have had in our contracts for a while. And, you know, we have it in bold font, you know, capitalized, et cetera. So um, this is what we have to put an insured on notice that the contractor has the right to, to assert a lien uh, if they don't get paid for their work. And that's it. And I know that we don't have the ability to ask questions, but nonetheless, I thank you for uh, sitting through this presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about it or anything else that we can help you with. It is our goal to um, help contractors um, in the industry uh, be more successful. Before I go, American Policyholders Association is a great organization. Uh, they are focused on fraud committed by insurance companies and carriers. So if you've never heard about them, look them up. Um, and uh, I've got three disclaimers here. Uh, one's for email, one's for your website. And uh, this, like the I'm not a public adjuster language in the contract, I think is really helpful on your website because um, I have seen crazy things on somebody's website. Somebody who doesn't live in Texas writes a website for a contractor and finds some what they think is cool language on someone else's website. They stick it in there and uh, there's a UPPA violation in there. So this disclaimer can help with that. And then finally, there's an Xactimate disclaimer. And anyone who's interested in talking about these disclaimers or anything else, I'm happy to discuss. And with that, I thank you very much. This is concluded. <laughs>